Um, so, uh, I want to thank you all for coming today. I'm Amanda Fallis, I'm an archivist at the City Archives, and we are grateful to Dr. Angela Allen Bell and the Panthers and all of our speakers today for coming out to um, give this presentation at the main library. Uh, we'll be recording it, and we'll put up a video later in November, but Ms. Ford is also live streaming on Facebook here. Um, the order of the program, we'll start with Rayvon, we'll give a couple remarks, then Dr. Bell, then we'll do the panel with everybody. And also um, at the end, we'll have some closing remarks as well. And um, I'm excited to get started. With that said, would you like to begin, Rayvon? Good morning, everybody. So I will be covering pretty much the introductory part of today's program. So let's begin. In October of 1966, the Black Panther Party was founded in Oakland, California, co-founded by Huey Newton, a law student, and Bobby Seal, a college student. These two individuals began meeting to discuss the lack of African-American studies at a university that Seal was attending and Newton had previously attended. Their efforts, their successful endeavors led them to test their vision in the community of Oakland and ask them, what are their concerns? What are their concerns? Those responses became a 10-point plan, which served as a foundation to their work. The 10-point plan is not just 10 points. The 10-point plan is present mainstream demand. Just to list off a few, those 10-point plans discuss employment. The, they wanted to end the pillage of black communities. They wanted military exemption, education, decent housing. The 10-point plan goes on to cite language from the Declaration of Independence. What we see from this is that the contours of the Black Panther Party was a movement being shaped by the Constitution due to Huey Newton's legal training. The Black Panther Party leaned heavily on the Constitution, on the promises that the Constitution held. They invigorated the First Amendment with verbal and written artistic messages. They embraced the Second Amendment and bore arms upon the belief that armed self-defense was necessary for the protection of the black community against state-sanctioned violence. Because of Newton's legal training, they tested the country's fidelity to the Fourth Amendment by organizing police, police patrols in response to community complaints of, of brutality and unlawful searches and seizures. They did this with law books in hand. They resisted the, any attempts to render the 14th Amendment's equal protection and due process clause platitude. The Black Panther Party built its framework upon liberating, the liberating power of education and upon the notion that people learn by participation. They promoted education in communities and amongst their members. To be good teachers, you first had to learn. Members were required to study revolutions in Africa, Europe, Asia, Latin America, Cuba, amongst a host of other materials. Members lived in communal housing, engaged in fundraising in order to sustain their programs. Labored without salary from, without a salary from early morning until night. And somehow, things took a turn. Thank you. In this story, the villain that we're going to learn about is not that man in the ski mask that's wearing those dark gloves and shades. The villains in this story actually wore suits. The vision, villains in this story use law books and they use policy as their weapons of choice. Now, what do I mean when I say this word policy? What I mean when I speak of policy is simply the passage of laws that reinforce attitudes and beliefs that people have in governmental capacities. Another way to explain policy is simply the conscience of the people, the things that we tolerate or refuse to tolerate in a society. So let's consider an example of what policy looks like in action. I saw a few days ago a headline and it says, six deer hit in two months. And there's a warning to drivers not to hit these deer. This is a true headline. Now, remember what policy is. 
It's all about the beliefs and the attitudes that result in us changing laws and policy. And so in this instance of the deer being hit, the policy is to address speeders. It is to protect those deers. And so what is this jurisdiction going to do? It's going to install speed bumps and deer crossing signs. Now those are the policies, right? It's the ideas and the beliefs, but then law comes in to follow up on that policy. And what law does is make it a crime to speed. And so law creates these consequences that are imposed upon those folks who go through this subdivision speeding and potentially hitting deer. So now that you understand policy, I'm here to hopefully explain how policy was used against the members of the Black Panther Party. There are several important policy players here. There's first, the governor at the time of Louisiana, who was John J. McKithen. And as soon as Governor McKithen learned that there would be Black Panthers in the state of Louisiana, he goes public and he makes a statement that I will quote, I'm going to hit them right between the eyes. These people will never have a foothold in this community, so says Governor McKithen. Another player here is John J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. He's also a key policy player, and he's the brainchild of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program that was used in the 60s and the 70s against many activists in this country and many advocacy groups. In 1968, Hoover issues a memo, and it is dispersed across the entire country to every FBI office in the United States. And that memo says, I quote, the Black Panther Party is the most violent prone organization of all extremist groups. And in this memo, he accuses them of engaging in physical attacks on the police. Jager Hoover directed all of his officers to increase the use of informants and to accelerate efforts to disrupt this group. President Nixon was also a policy player. Nixon wanted an ongoing end to protests that were happening around the South to challenge segregation and conditions on HBCU campuses. So what did the president do? He put federal pressure on local governments to stop organizing over civil rights and any agitation over equal rights in the country. Now you ask, Professor, we understand all of these policy players, but what about law? Law was actually stretched, law was bent, law was maneuvered to justify raids, evictions, as well as to harass, to search, to seize, to silence, to try, to overcharge, to over-sentence, to convict, and to wrongfully incarcerate. Now, by now, in this point in time, we have many published cases and a few very credible investigations that establish, as a matter of fact, the Black Panther Party were victims of routine. And I stress the word routine, First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, and 14th Amendment violations. There's even a case where an FBI officer admits under oath that he was instructed by FBI security and superiors to engage in constitutional violations against the Panthers and do anything needed to neutralize the party. There's even more cases now in the law books that show that there were local and federal collaborations used all across the United States for one purpose, and it had nothing to do with law enforcement. It was about neutralizing the Black Panther Party. In the ensuing years, we have now congressional hearings that have officially revealed that J. Edgar Hoover's tactics against the Black Panther Party and other activist groups were often illegal and unconstitutional. Another development now over time is that partial, and when I say partial, I mean small, I mean tiny levels of accountability has now begun to happen. 
There have been several civil lawsuits in favor of Black Panthers, such as Louisiana native Fred Hampton, such as Louisiana's native Geronimo Pratt, and then the Angola Three, who we are privileged to have one of which with us today. We've also now learned over time that many of these criminal charges against the Black Panther Party were ultimately dropped. We also have now learned that many of the cases against them were actually lost at trial or never even brought to trial. I mentioned as an example, many of the Panther members that you'll meet today from Louisiana's chapter who were brought to death row and who awaited on death row for months to be taken before a Louisiana jury on trial charges that were overcharged in their case, and they were all ultimately exonerated by a Louisiana jury. And that's just one example of how we know now that a lot of these criminal cases were used as a pretext against the Black Panther Party simply to remove them from the streets so that they could not effectively organize. Now, you're about to hear from members of the Louisiana chapter, both outside of prison and inside of prison in Louisiana, their truth. As you listen to them speak their truth, I would ask that you listen for ways that law and policy happen to have been at work. I'm asking you to hear the rich lessons that they hold about national security, designations that happen to people even today, I'm asking that you consider what the Constitution meant when it was applied to this particular group of American citizens, many of whom are veterans. I implore you to consider if this story involves a situational abuse of power, or if really the first, second, fourth, sixth, and 14th amendments of the United States Constitution has really been reduced now to false promises. What I'm asking, more important than anything, is that you consider your role in this story, your role in preventing ever again the advent of another group that will suffer the torture and the brutality and the excesses that the Louisiana Black Panther Party and the National Party suffered. <coughs> Panel members, I want to end by thanking you for your service. And now uh, it is my honor to yield to you to speak your truth. I'd like to do a quick introduction of everybody on the stage, if that's okay. Um, our speakers today will be Betty uh, Toussaint Aylesworth, uh, Ron Aylesworth, General Rico Forbes, Brian Hunter, uh, Jason Lawrence, Robert King, and Malik Rahim, and Mariana Curry. And with that said, thank you. Please take it away, Betty. I was 20 years old at the time. I made 21 while I was in jail. I was shot at the age of 20. I hadn't made 21 yet. In the second shootout in the Desert Housing Project. Uh, the next question will be What type of harm did you face because of your involvement in the Black Panther Party? But once I had been released from jail after 11 months and three weeks and not being found guilty of anything, uh, the police over on the West Bank in Algiers is where I'm from. They used to follow me, follow me around. I used to be uh, selling the Panther papers on the West Bank, and they would follow me. I'd go in the drugstore. They would be there. They'd make little nasty comments. And, um, you know, getting a job wasn't easy at that time, and I dared apply for too many places because once I said I was part of the Black Panther Party, the doors were closed. Thank you. I'm Mariana Curry. Uh, how old was I when I joined the Black Panther Party? I was 14 years old. I was in the ninth grade. The other question I would like to address is dispelling the myth about the Black Panther Party. For me, it's very important that everybody understands 
who we were, who we are, and the work that we did. That got lost among all the foolishness and among all the racism that was going on in the country, particularly with the FBI and the CIA. So people didn't look at the programs that we created, like children having free breakfast in the morning. We created that program, not the United States government. We did it. We got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We got out there and hustled up different, you know, groceries and grits and stuff to cook for the children. I would come in the morning, and I would serve breakfast. Baba Monique was there, Brian was there, Jason was there, and I would go to school after. I sold Black Panther Party papers on Canal Street with my comrades, Cloud Nine and everybody. That's what we did. We took care of our people. We took care of the community and the needs of our people. And that got swept under the rug. So it's very crucial for me as a party member that everyone know and everyone understand the work that we did. We were not racist. Please do not ever compare us to the Ku Klux Klan. Please. Never. Never. So that was very important for me. It's very important, I'm going to say it again, that everybody understand who we were, who we are and the things that we did. Yeah, I've got, I've got Ron next. Ron. Ron. Oh, Brian. Ron. Ron, I have Ron next on the program. All right. I joined the Black Panther Party. I was 21 years old. Brother that told me it was brother from California and Steve Green. I went over to the house on St. Thomas Street and Steve was there. So I joined that so At that time, we called NAS Committee to come back faster before we evolved into the Louisiana chapter that comes party. And I was one of the first few that they didn't get out as we got found that guilty because I had convicted of a, a bank robbery. And I was sent to the Fed. I did four years on 20 years. I come back here in 1975. I ended up getting shot up and captured at the end where I did four years and then go. And you might say, I see a question here about the Panthers in prison. When I got to prison, they sent me on a walk, and Herman Wallace was there, and Comrade Wilcox. We started one of the first chapters, Louisiana chapter I before it in there. And King become a member of that. Him and the longest kept political prisoner in the state of Louisiana, Kenny Zulu Whitmore. So we all need to get and try to get that brother some support. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, General Rico Forbes. Good morning. Good morning. How old was I when I joined the Black Panther Party? I was 19 years old. Uh, what role did I play within the Black Panther Party? I came in with the, black, with the understanding of Black Panther Party for <laughs> self defense. So I was more you know, a country boy, so I had a lot of knowledge in dealing with weaponry and all. Uh, and one of the things that uh, our community needed was protection from the police. The police was uh, real brutal to the members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, every law that possible that uh, we was taught to obey, they themselves decided that, you know, there was no rules. Uh, I myself also went to the penitentiary for bank robbery. I stayed 22 years in penitentiary. The thing is that uh, really brought it to the front of what home was brought towards me was the idea that they violated the law when they convicted me twice for bank robbery. <laughs> One was armed robbery of a bank and the other was bank robbery. I received 15 for the feds and 40 for the, 40 for the state altogether. I had 55 years. I was 21 years old, just got married. You know, I was like 13 months and I had a 10 month year old baby. Yes, next we have Mr. Brian Hunter. Morning, everyone. All power to the people. All power to the people. My name is Brian and 
I was uh, 15 years old when I joined the Black Panther Party. Um, it is, uh, I came by way of, of uh, being a part of another organization at the time, the night before the first shootout, which was September the 14th, uh, where I was attending a uh, political education class uh, where I would become more conscious of the Black Panther Party, right? Uh, the organization that, that I was a part of were emulating some of the things that the Black Panther Party were doing, such as the free breakfast program. Uh, those were the type of things that were going on that we were impressed with, with the Black Panther Party. And we, we emulated some of the things and uh, the policies that the Black Panther Party stood for, uh, especially the 10 point platform at that time. Uh, my role at that time, when I became a member, was due to the first shootout, and then the second shootout, which Betty was a, a part of, uh, we reopened the next office uh, upon uh, up up here, which we call Uptown, upon Russia Blade, right adjacent to the Calio project at that time. Um, <coughs> and as I said. Uh, I was a student at that time, and uh, the party encouraged education, so uh, I was a student at Booker T. Washington High School, where, again, uh, I also would get up in the morning and do the breakfast program to feed the children, uh, and part of a number of uh, programs that, that were initiated by the Black Panther Party. And to this day, I continue to try to be a servant of the people in the community and keep the struggle going. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Next, we have Mr. Jason Lawrence. Good morning, everybody. Power to the people. Let me start off by, where's Angela? Angela, your power of influence is amazing. I didn't want to break your heart, so that's what I'm here. But uh, I joined the party uh, when I, I think I was 16. I was, Brian and I was at Booker T. Washington together. And, uh, and what attracted me to the party was that I always tell people this, their lack of fear. Uh, I saw people, young people that didn't show any fear to, to the oppression that was going on in the community. and uh, we, I, we, uh, breakfast program, Brian and I was, our corner was right down Canal and Rampart, selling Panther newspapers. Uh, Mariam, I mean, it's, I have so many memories, I tell you, man, but, uh, I see a question say, how did the Panthers select the communities they worked in? Wherever black people were oppressed at, that's where the party was. Uh, I'm not much of a talker, but, uh, thank y'all for coming out and, and <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, next we have Mr. Robert King. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you, panel members. Uh, my name is Robert, Robert King, Robert H. King, and I'm uh, or what some people call the last survivor of the angle of the three. Uh, however, I do take, which is true to an extent for for writing, but uh, for true issues. Uh, it wasn't just Angola 3, uh, even though Angola 3, we became Angola 3, and we all, well, subsequently, we joined uh, the Black Panther Party while we were in prison. Uh, we understood that there were much more than Angola 3. We understood that there were, in Louisiana, there, there were the nations 333 to 
Um, the city study is 3,033 in the nations, uh, 333,000 people in prison, and many of them were in prison, you know, for many of them were trumped up charges, and especially of the Black Panther Party. But a moving forward in my issue with the Black Panther Party, I was in prison uh, when I, not that I had heard from, I heard from, about the Black Panther Party many years, but I was in uh, prison during the time and I, I had was arrested for an armed robbery, which was questionable, they offered me a certain amount of time. And I ended up getting 35 years, instead of the 15 years they offered me, I went to trial and I, I got 30 years. And that was a time when I began to put things in the context. I was in New Orleans, a uh, pair prison, and uh, uh, there weren't any way out, uh, except one way, I think I began to focus on some things. Um, but that was beyond low. I had heard about them the Black Panther Party. I had heard about uh, many organizations before the Black Panther Party. I heard about, you know, uh, Andrew Framel, uh, Fannie, Lou, uh, Fannie Lou. I had heard about Malcolm X. I knew about Malcolm, uh, um, um, Martin Luther King and so forth. But uh, the Black Panther Party came along and I think they kind of uh, got my guys because I was in prison again, like I said, facing the charge and here I was, uh, uh, my charge was well, the thing that I was arrested for was being uh, talked about in public by a group that I knew nothing about or knew little about, and it was members of the Black Panther Party. And I thought at that time, well, I, I was in a New Orleans Parish prison and I had escaped and I was recaptured and it, I was on the fifth floor and I think the first shootout uh, uh, that occurred, uh, I was listening to it because there was a single television that they had on the uh, the chair where I was, which was a formal death row chair, uh, and we were able to watch the television from a corner of our eye. We were able to listen to it, and I remember the brothers and sisters in the in the in the house in the shootout, and it was then and there that I decided that I would want to be a member to represent uh, who the Black Panther Party was trying to represent. I would wanted to be a member. I wanted to join a group that was struggling for some of the things that I was struggling for. Alumni, we hereby, we hereby present Angela A. Allen Bell with this award and recognition for commitment, fortitude, and service to the legacy of the Black Panther Party, all power to the people. to say this is the absolute biggest honor of my life. I made a commitment many years ago when I started reading transcripts and just saw the injustice in this and I am relentless about the pursuit of rectifying this damage. So thank you all. I'm honored to be with you. And, and I also want to say that I have a husband in the back that I cannot take this with and not give half of it to him. Okay. <laughs> because he has been a real trooper with me through this. So thank you all, that's my husband, David. Thank you so much. Are you, are you gonna, did you wanna answer some of the questions as well, Mr. Reagan? Well, well I, I really, I was yes. waiting for my time just to <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I want to thank y'all because I was a little boy when y'all was living out loud. I appreciate all y'all. Thank you. Again, my name is uh, Malik Rahim. Uh, I joined the NCCF at 22. I was a Vietnam veteran. I was married and had two kids. Uh, I'll never forget the shootout that I was at because they, they knew that we had kids that was living in the office <clears throat> and no consideration was made to those kids. Police came, they got in the position and they started shooting. They shot at, our, at the house we was in 20 minutes and after 20 minutes I guess they figured that they had killed the homeless. They stopped and we walked out. Not one of us was in. 
no one was dead. Uh, we left from there, we went to court, and then to death row, all in one day. 11 months later, after a jury trial that lasted months, the jury went out and in one half hour of deliberation, they found us innocent of all charges. Uh, General Rico and I, we have worked on pulling the legacy of assuring that our legacy won't be one of a criminal organization. And it's because of the work of Angela Bell that we will not be recognized as a criminal organization. Uh, she helped us get a proclamation. I started to bring it from the mayor. We asked him for the same thing from the black caucus of the state of Louisiana. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's what I call it. The, uh, state representative. And we're going to ask the governor before he get out of office out of office to rectify what had happened to her and what we had to suffer over the last 53 years. That's how long we've been here either as an NCCF or as a Black Panther Party chapter. Uh, with that, my position in the party was the OD. And that's the officer of the day. Whatever orders I was given, it was upon me to make sure that that, was, that order was carried out. Uh, as for nationally, the most beautiful thing I ever experienced in my life is to going to a strange city and be accepted <clears throat> by brothers that didn't look upon me as a friend, but as a comrade. And that's the greatest experience that I've ever had. Because just about any city that had a chapter of the Black Panther Party. We are accepted as comrades when we visit that way. Thank you so much, y'all. I want to introduce Omarosa Newman next to uh, give a uh, looking forward, law and policy and redress. And after our speakers finish, we'll do Q&A with the Panthers. And um, we'll, at that time, I'll come up. And if you have a question you'd like to ask, I'll ask you to line up behind the mic. But we'll do that after Omarusa, Tanshu, um, and our next two speakers. Pushed into the corner of the hobnob boot. Pushed into the corner of the I don't want to cry or die. Pushed into the corner of I don't want to study war no more to I for an eye. The panther in his desperate boldness wears no disguise. Motivated by the truest of the oldest lies. Power to the people. Power to the people, power to the people. This poem was written by Langston Hughes in honor of the struggle and the work of the Panthers. You see, Langston spent the latter part of his life in the struggle and in the movement. And so I stand on the shoulders of those who recognize that we have an incredible responsibility to carry on the legacy and the work. And so the redress, the work must be done
through the policy and the law to ensure that it is not forgotten. You see, the struggle continues. The struggle continues. And so that is why Professor Bell has poured into her students. I am a third year student at Southern University Law Center and I am not alone. Your legacy is in good hands because there are young people who are committed to this work. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I will have all the students from Southern University Law Center just stand up for a moment and be acknowledged. Thank you. Mentioned previously is the work that was done that must be preserved. Sister Curry mentioned the Feeding of Children, a program that certainly was taken and, and tried to be duplicated, but we still have hungry children in this country, but particularly in our community. The Panthers was about self-reliance and building up an economy in our community so that we were not reliant on the government. And so there must be a way that we create programs that emulate and duplicate this effort so that the legacy and the work continues. Additionally, the Panthers focused on self-discipline, but particularly disciplining children. And if you look at the way that our community has been pushed back with some of the interworkings of our youth, we need that work to continue. But also the fight against capitalism and the building of wealth in the black community started with the Panthers. And so the work of policy and law must take a critical look. And the leaders who work in this space, policy analysts like myself, must find a way in the educational space, but also government leaders must find a way to create policies and not allow this push against critical race theory to rewrite our history. Your work was not in vain. Your struggle was not in vain. And we will not forget the sacrifices that were made and we will memorialize it by pushing the work of more policy that helped to build up our community as opposed to tear down our community, more power to the people. Good morning, everyone. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Tian Shu Fu, and I was born and raised in Beijing, China. I wish I could say colorism only existed in America, but that would be a lie. Growing up in a country where the majority of the population is the same ethnicity, I was used to being blind. By that, I mean I never had to think about people of a different race. I did have the privilege to travel at a very young age. I was put in perspective as a kid that other cultures and lives existed. There are people who don't look like me living on this earth. I visited mainly European countries due to my mom's job. Well, white supremacy and racism are terms I didn't understand until I was 18 and came to America. But colorism though, colorism is so entrenched everywhere in the world that we were, we were raised to hate our skin tone. We were taught to want to be lighter skinned, the lighter the better. We were taught to hate our not taut enough noses and not big enough eyes. Fortunately, I was surrounded by a very diverse group of student artists who advocate through the forms of art. I caught myself up to speed with a general understanding of how race works in America my first year there. But all this didn't hit hard until 2020. That was a very rough year for everyone. It was that year I saw how whistleblower was silenced. It was that year George Floyd was tragically murdered. It was that year I saw real footage of what I read in books about occupied Palestine. It was that year I learned more about the Black Panther Party and saw the movie Judas and the Black Messiah. It was also that year I learned that I wouldn't be here today on this land if it weren't for Dr. King and the Immigration Act after the Civil Rights Act. The next year, eight Asian women were murdered by a white man with Asian fetish in Atlanta. I decided to go to law school and become an attorney so I could make changes. It has been a long time coming, but I always know which side of the history I wanted to be on. 
When I read Fred Hampton's case in criminal procedure, it connected to the visual of the movie I watched in 2020. That was the truth. Fred Hampton was murdered in cold blood in his sleep by FBI agents. He died working on the Rainbow Coalition, a multicultural and anti-racist movement. It makes sense that white supremacists want him dead. Please don't cancel me just yet. I want you to take a second and just imagine how powerful it would be if we all stood together and said that we had enough of this BS made up social concept. Just imagine how powerful that would be. The idea of people uniting was so powerful and it made J. Edgar Hoover so terrified that he had to drug Fred Hampton and shot him to beyond death, overkilled a man in his sleep. It wasn't the man that they were trying to kill, it was what he represented. He was a true leader, could unify and empower the masses. I came to America expecting to see people from all cultures thriving in this mountain pot. The person who epitomizes this American dream that I aspire to is now the subject of a false narrative instead of a celebrated icon. In the final analysis, my perspective as an international student is that the Black Panther Party has taught me what the American ideal of diversity is. The Black Panther Party inspired the whole world with its revolutionary solutions and services. I hope we can get back to them, get back the love that they gave us by showing power to the people. Thank you both. Um, we want to take a moment here um, for uh, Chuck Tony of Troy Carter's office and Dimitri um, of Troy Carter's office. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Chuck is from the city council, Freddie King's office, I apologize. And Dimitri is from Troy Carter's office. And they would like to come uh, give some acknowledgments for y'all. pretty close, I'm gonna say good morning and good afternoon. Um, and I wanna thank you guys for putting on this, uh, this symposium. We were really excited to hear that you were doing it. Unfortunately, we, uh, there was a little mix up in finding us. So I know um, one of the things you guys requested was to do a congressional record. And for those of you that um, would like to know, a congressional record is a document that remains in the Library of Congress in perpetuity that tells a particular story. Um, but with Congress in its position where it is today and getting ready to do the people's work, we pray and hope on, um, on Monday, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, it was very difficult for us to be able to get that particular document found. But what we did do is I have a, um, a letter here from Congressman Troy Carter and it says, greetings. I'm excited to welcome this academic conference to the city of New Orleans and to extend a special greeting to all participants and special speakers. The way in which the history of America is told often neglects the African American perspective. It is imperative that we work towards educating ourselves and others on African American history, because African American history is American history. Conferences such as this, as this one, are integral to that work. Once again, I would like to express gratitude to the hosts for holding this event in the city of New Orleans and extend a special welcome to all those in attendance today. Thank you guys so much for being here. We look forward to you guys doing additional events such as this in the future. We also have a, um, a proclamation for you guys, certificate, and it's from the U.S. House of Representatives, Congressman Troy A. Carter, Sr., United States Representative of Louisiana's 2nd Congressional District, celebrates dispelling the myth of Black Pantherism event with the Louisiana Black Panther for hosting this event in the city of New Orleans on this 28th day of October in the year 2023. And it too is signed by Congressman Troy Carter. Thank you so much.
We gave the the seven. seven together. So I don't know if we're up here without getting this. No, come on. All right. No, good. I'm sure. Trying to say something. Okay. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name's Chuck Tony. Um, I'm Council Member Freddie King's Chief of Staff. Um, he sorry they couldn't be here today, but he wanted me to come by and make sure that we acknowledge these eight individuals here that have done so much for us. Uh, I, the history, just reading some of it, is just amazing that these are living, breathing legends. And we wanted to give uh, a very small token from the city council, signed by all council members for each individual. Um, and I, I won't read it out loud, but it's basically just proclaiming and recognizing the accomplishments that these individuals have done. Um, so we're very excited about this opportunity as an SULC graduate myself, um, along with Along with Council Member Freddie King, uh, he definitely wanted to um, help out and um, with his former professor, um, uh, Dr. Angela Bell. So we definitely thank her for putting this on. Um, and so thank you and thank you to you all for the history that you've done to pave the way for people like myself. Thank you. Thank you both so much, and thank you all. Um, I would like to introduce Attorney Juan LaFonta for a perspective from the next generation. You know, I didn't even write this on my paper, but I'm sure most of the younger people in here are like, what to do with the Big Frida commercials doing, talking about the future rights of politics and, and our leaders in generation. But for those that don't know, I'm the former chairman of the Black Caucus of Louisiana. I was one of the lead organizers for the Genius Six, as well as several stand-ins after Katrina that brought thousands to the Capitol, actually shut it down a couple times, using the model of the Panthers, while I was elected after 2005 to about 2010. Some of the people that are close to my age actually remember the fights, the arguments, and the push. So I listened to these brothers all week and sisters, and I just wanted to give you all a formula. First thing I want to do is, I want to tell y'all, so please take notes. Whoever has notepads, take notes, because a lot of young folks ask, how can they do certain stuff? This is some keys. First book I want to tell y'all, y'all need to read, is The Art of War. You cannot move without understanding how Sun Tzu moved. He said, know your terrain. That's the equivalent of the environment. He says, know that you may not always have permanent enemies, but you have permanent issues. And to know thy enemy is to know thyself. So one of the things I'm kind of concerned about is when I was elected in politics, it was how do you move you from this place, this culture, and you're about the culture, and you believe in your people, but all your people ain't really for you. They're not literally moving like we moving. You think, because they look like us, that they us. A lot of men. So I kind of want to give y'all some guidelines moving forward because a lot of times we're aligning with the wrong people and when they prop us up on a stick and use us for propaganda and leave us to burn on the side of the road, you're wondering why. So this is kind of the education. Uh, one is beware of spooks that sit by doors. Mm. If you haven't read the book, go by Sister Vera on Body Road and get it. It will give you a lot of guidance. Be very careful of people that use cold words. I remember when I was in, in uh, the legislature, people used to always say to get over on the preservationists that preservation is economic development. 
And I mean, the preservation so open up like that. But that was all they knew about preservation was it was economic development. You need to have people that know and understand what's behind the covers, what's the deeper meanings. This is going to rub some people, but I'm going to say it anyway, and I care less if you don't like it. But we got to get out of this dark skin, light skin thing. We got to stop saying because somebody light skin, they got less credibility than a dark skin person. We got to say because somebody's dark skin, they, they have some kind of peace towards being a criminal. And we got to start treating each other like human beings. A person should be defined by their actions, not by their skin tone. And we can't hold other people accountable if we don't hold ourselves accountable. So when you're researching who you align with, don't just do it on Facebook and Instagram. Go actually on the World Wide Web. They got a lot of information there. These are some questions you need to ask about your new friends that's going to help you change the world for our people. One, look at the source of the funds and their alliances. Two, look at the previous outcomes these folks have had when they've interacted with other people in these spheres of influence. Look at how much they're standing in front for the camera versus being the ones holding the line. A lot of times you just look at the news and see these people run up on the TV. What do you see them when you're digging ditches or building human chains or trying to change the world? But they like that minute on TV because they can tell everybody that, that vilified. Uh, beware of people on social media and TV with no background for human rights or equality. Don't make it the first time you made a comment the, the time you made on Channel 6. Make it when nobody was around, when somebody needed to be defended or protected. Also, last one is beware of single issue people because they are part of the problems and not the solutions. See, because if you really understand who we are as a people, you understand we move as a community. So that a community has all these different needs and wants and desires, can't be satisfied by a single issue. A single issue person has the financial ability to say, this is all I'm going to take on because the only thing that's bothering me because I got enough money to blow through everything else. But as a community, because we face so many vestiges of the negative that's been put upon our people, we have to move as a community and they can't be a sacrifice of any one of us. Again, I'll say, know that you may not always have permanent enemies, but you will have permanent issues. And then in closing, I'll quote Sun Tzu, because obviously, from the stuff I read from y'all, all of y'all know what Sun Tzu did and how it teaches us to go in and do what you got to do. It says, if you sit by the river long enough, the body of your enemy will float right by you. So please, for the people in here who have not learned patience, who have not looked into Buddhism or Confucianism, or looked into all those things that should still your mind, you can change the world by being still and accepting the universe as it is. But when you consistently fight and with no purpose, with no strategy, with just a struggle, you will struggle for the rest of your life. And I'm telling y'all what I learned because I come out to seven more. I got bricklayers on the side family. I got full first cousins that serving multiple life sentences on one side. I got one that just got to doing 10 in Georgia. On the other side, I got Broadway playwrights and politicians in the Bagneris family. So it's like, it doesn't matter where you're from you can really change things. And the stuff I'm telling y'all really will give you a formula moving forward. And I think a lot of youth had asked for this at one of the symposiums at Dilla. They're like, how do we move? This is how you move. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was excellent. I would love to call up Mr. Trent Smith next with the charge for moving us forward. Good afternoon. Question, what are you willing to sacrifice for what you believe in? What is your definition of revolution? I know plenty of people that will tell you what they think they would do or what they imagine they have done, or they would have done. But the truth is, most, most of us, we're, we're, not, we're not built like these kings and queens that we are honoring today. That's just the reality. There are young men and women in this generation with the heart and courage of the Panthers, but 
COINTEL PRO did a good job of replacing the narrative of the party with falsehoods and negative stereotypes to the extent that most of our own people turned their backs on the party, which spawned an emptiness in the youth due to a lack of guidance only filled by tribal armies in which we call gangs today. Some wanted to be a part of a community revolution in progress, so they became crips. While others believed that brotherly love overcomes oppressive domination, thus becoming bloods. And both sides had only themselves as guidance in a world of oppression and lack. So what does the government do? They provide resources in the form of drugs and greed took dominion over revolution. They literally went from protecting their community from the oppressors to protecting the financial resources of their communities from one another, which reverted their anger from the man to themselves. Genesis, third chapter, first verse of the Bible states, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. How fitting a Bible verse for the COINTELPRO playbook. How can we fix this? How can we stop our children from killing each other under these false pretenses of success? Can it, it can be done because the people on this panel have done it. They have the courage to tell the drug dealers in their community, hey, look, we can't stop you from selling drugs, but we can and we will stop you from selling drugs in our community. Who in here is willing to have their torches of revolution lit by the elders to fight for what's right? Not, not black, not white, but right. Uh, what I thought I heard about getting the message out, because I expected to have thousands of people today at that expungement clinic uh, to give second chances. Uh, people who can apply for uh, housing, employment, and jobs and we've only had 10 people so far. Um, my partner in justice here, Candace Well, who co-authored that bill, but uh, is alongside me in the House fighting continuously. We've been all over about the importance of this past election, and we saw the t returns of that October 14th. We need help. You have two legislators here who are not afraid to speak up and speak out. Two legislators here who are not afraid to run the good bills that someone else might call controversial bills. But we need to change the faces of those that are making the decisions. So I met with some students this week at Xavier University, between 50 and 60 of them, lost. No idea about things in your fight and your struggle. And I talked to my sister, uh, Angela, about perhaps bringing members of the Black Panther to our children, our babies, who have no idea what it took for you guys have no idea that they're at Xavier right now in school pursuing higher education because of the sacrifices that you made. Um, and they're not learning it in school. We want to fight the book ban, but they're already not learning. Our history is already being erased. So my, my, my thing is don't get lost in the brush fires. The book ban is huge, but they're already not learning. The house is burning. We got to focus on the burning house. We take care of the brush fires too, but we gotta focus on the burning house because if the majority of the voters were 65 older in this last election, and then my generation, 50 to 65, were the second highest, what happens in 20 years? What happens in 20 years? We have the highest rate of middle school dropout students right now, middle school. And those are the ones that are committing the crime. But if they're committing crime and they've dropped out of school, they're also engaging in sexual activity, which means they're producing children. And if they're lost at 13, 14, 16, 15, imagine where their children will be in 20 years. We have to take it upon ourselves in this room to help reach that demographic of people. And I'm not really sure, I was so um, saddened after the election and, but now I got my second wing back. I want to figure out how 
we reach the people that we're missing. If it's social media influencers, I'm down for whatever. So if you have ideas, don't hesitate reaching out to myself, Rep Noel, to give us ideas on how to bring back awareness of what we had to fight for. And also to, to know that it won't happen overnight. Talking to those 18 to 22, 23 year olds the other day, I realized they want microwave help. <laughs> you know, they want it immediately. And I, I talked about the bus boycott being 381 days, and this is 50 to 60 kids, and I asked what in their lives could they commit to for 381 days? <laughs> Nothing. I think I would have lied to me. <laughs> I'd have made up something, but they had no shame in saying nothing. We have to reach that, that, that demographic. So it brings me great honor and joy today to be here to recognize those whose shoulders we stand on today. I've known Malik for a while. He, he talks to me quite often about my platform. I know his beautiful wife. Uh, they have been there to shore me up in my battles. Uh, at the state capitol. Uh, so I'll let my partner in justice speak. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm State Representative Candace Newell, and um, it is an honor to be here today to honor the men and women before us. Um, I am not proud to say that I did not know a whole lot about the men and women that are sitting on this stage until I was became the, where did she go? I just had my eyes on her. Before I became Professor Bell's research assistant at the Southern University Law Center. And it gave me additional pride in learning exactly what the Black Panther Party stood for and trying to dislearn what the media had fed us so many years. And learning that these men and women did not start trying to be violent. It was always about self-protection, but also self-pride and taking care of our communities. And particularly here in New Orleans, the standoff and the desire of um, housing development, a part of the city that I now represent, that was a city amongst itself, but the media had fed us that it was a violent and deplorable area of the city. And that did not deter the men and women of the Black Panther Party here in this city from going out there and saying, you will not sell drugs in this community. We will protect the children and the women and the men in this community. We will give them the services that they deserve. And that was just, so empowering to me. But in these past four years in serving, it is now, not all of you are sitting here in front of me, but some of the people that we all know, that has disheartened me a little bit. And uh, it has made me sit back several times and ask myself, why do I keep doing this? Because we as a people expect our African-American representatives to fix every problem. But just as Rep. Boyd and I were talking this morning, you're not getting to the polls to give us somebody that we could work with. We can't fix all of the issues by ourselves just because of the limits of politics, because of what folks always like to remind us the, uh, checks and balances of government. That means I need help on the judicial branch and in the administrative branch. You have fighters on the legislative branch, but what do we do next? For the past eight years, we had John Bell Edwards to help us in the administrative branch. Now we have nothing. It has already been told to us that after we go in for our um, organizational session, which is our swearing in, we will immediately go into a criminal justice reform so, a special committee. So this expungement program that my colleague, Representative Boyd, put in effect through legislation, what if? What if that is on the cutting block? 
We didn't follow criminal justice reform that we have enjoyed for these past 20 years goes away. It, had, it would have gone in these last four years, but for John Bell Edwards being there to veto it. But what next? What is going to happen next? It, I couldn't even clap initially for this baby on the second row, knowing the response, all power to the people. But how do we protect that child? these two babies we have in the back. What is next? Because I often say we're going to work until we die. We're not going to be able to retire because we have not prepared our children who are coming up next with some kind of vision and giving them the information that they need to be the change makers that we all will need to make sure that the, pr the protections that our parents put in place are continued. I never thought that my great niece, yes, I'm a great aunt. Still grappling with that reality, but I never thought that she would have less rights than I have. We cannot <clears throat> sit here collectively and honor these brave souls that did not think about themselves. Because reading articles and watching specials about you all, it was always like, they were so brave. They didn't know this. How could they do this knowing that? Why are they doing this? And it was like you constantly put yourselves on the line. And now we can't even put our screen time on the line for change. We can't even put our nap time or our time to binge watch something on the line for change just to get out of our houses and go vote, just to come up to the Capitol and speak out, just to go to that building right there, wait, that? City Hall over there and tell them what we want and what we don't want in our city. We're not even willing to sacrifice this. And these people in front you have sacrificed literally their livelihood, their lives, not livelihood. We need y'all's help. We need y'all's help to be able to continue and build on what we already have, to grow and create what we want, and to keep in place what we are so vigilantly working for in the legislature. So with that, I'll jump off our soapbox and do what we can to do. This is a two-page resolution, and I will not read all of these words. But we're going to start with on behalf of the 37 members and our constituents, the Louisiana Black Caucus expresses their sincere appreciation of the highest honor as well as recognition for Huey P. Newton, Fred Hampton, Geronimo Pratt, Betty Toussaint Allensworth, Ryan Allensworth, General Rico Forbes, Brian Hunter, Jason Lawrence, Robert King, Malik Rahim, Mariama Curry and the countless Louisianians who sacrificed their life, freedom, and time to fight tirelessly to better the state of Louisiana and the United States of America. Be it further resolved that a suitable copy of this resolution, resolution is transmitted to Professor Bell for the Louisiana Black, Party, Black Panther Party archives on this 28th day of October 23rd, I mean, I'm sorry, October 28, 2023. And it is signed by the chairman of the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus, Vincent J. Pierre. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. No, I'm doing, um, yeah, I do. I'm going back to the soapbox for one second. Um, when we fight at the House of Representatives or the State Senate, know that I have brought bills before. I was blessed to be able to get this expungement bill out that no one was able to get out in the last 20 years. But even if you come to support us, which I saw with my exception for rape and incest bill, hundreds of cards and support, emails, we had so many people there that we had to open up an overflow room. I had clergy, rape victims, 
um, I shared my own personal story, doctors, the bill still failed in committee. Equal pay for women still failed in committee. Raising the minimum wage still failed in committee. Um, that's because the faces of those on the committee. And the only way to get them out is to vote. This special session on criminal justice that's coming up, that's because in the last eight years, we have been able to roll ourselves out of being the highest mass incarceration state. So they're losing money. Bodies in prison is money. They're losing 300 million a year. Jeff Landry's goal will be to put more bodies in prison. That, that's what happened with this. Uh, voter suppression. Jeff Landry filed the injunction to keep us from being in court October 3rd to fight for just one additional seat. We would do six in the House, three in the Senate, another congressional seat, another Bessie seat, another Supreme Court seat. John Bell only vetoed that one bill. They're fighting tooth and nail to keep us from getting one additional seat. The opportunity, because it's not a guaranteed election, the opportunity to elect someone. Our new governor filed the injunction to keep us from being in court. This is the pathway for what this administration will look like. We have to get involved. Now, to what we came here for. <laughs> so if we could um, have each one of you separately to come up. No, I don't know what you want to do. We, we, can, we can start with you, Malik, since you've been here. Especially you, my friend. <laughs> I have heard countless stories from you on your battles as a Black Panther member. Um, I honor you today. The Black Caucus honors you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> right in. Thank you. 
to getting help from you guys. We still have an election going on. Early voting starts November 3rd. Still some state seats available. Uh, District 23 is um, also very important for me. It may not be important for everyone because it is one of those minority seats that's on the ballot. Uh, Sean Mina, so if you know anyone that lives in the mid-city area, please make sure that they go out to vote because if they've given us an opportunity to elect someone that looks like us and we don't take it, that is their argument in court as well, because that's our argument. We deserve equal representation. Our early voting starts November 3rd through November 11th. Election day is November 18th. Please continue passing the word on that. Thank you. So, so before you guys leave out, um, all of my representatives that are here, we would we, we set out to find the address of the place that, where the shootout was held, and we were told that ad, that address no longer exists. I'm sorry. I don't know. So we set out as a Louisiana alumni chapter mm -hmm. to attempt to purchase the building, the property where the first shootout was held mm -hmm. in the ninth war. Mm -hmm. We were told it didn't exist. So we need assistance in trying to find that property okay. and to make it historical okay. and to put a historical plaque there. We'll definitely do what we can to help you with that. So yes. if you, I'll make sure you have my office phone number before we leave. Yes. And I'll make sure you have my call because that's, that's the call that's the city that I represent. Yes. yes. We were also told that the um, the information and all of the court documents and records from the trial of the New Orleans 12, they couldn't find them. So we also are looking for that as well, to get a copy of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Digital. Things that make you go, hmm. Right, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be on board with helping you with that. Thank you all. Thank you, representatives. Um, I would like to introduce Mr. Coleman from the NAACP for a final remark. Good afternoon. I always have to get permission. But I was taught in the Black Panther Party. May I have permission to speak? Oh, yes, sir. I'm a, I am a product of the, Black, of the Black Panther Party. In 1968, in St. Francis de Sales Church, the first chapter was in the St. Thomas Project. Mm -hmm. 
and also moved to St. Francis de Sales Church, which that Catholic church turned African in its culture. I was in a breakfast line, and we were taught manners and responsibility and respect. And this big thing came out that the Black Panther Party was teaching violence. Well, I was taught to read backwards. I learned my 14 time papers all the way to 20. In 1968, at 12 years old. By the time I got the guts, they thought I was a Martian. But I had training with the Black Panther Party. And over the years, me and dear brother Malik always kept in touch with my classmate right there. He can tell you, when we were at Woodson, they thought we was a genius. But we were taught. But we also was taught civil rights. We were taught about the bills. And one of the things happened with me today, I have serious issues when we have community leaders say, my light out my neighborhood, I'm going to call the governor. That does not make sense. Civil engagement is not a spectator sport, right, Brother Mandy? He said, we can fight for civil rights, but you can't sit on the side. You got to get out there. And two weeks ago, we was on the side. You know, we was on the side. But I, I, I'm, just, I'm still upset about the governor's election, this past election period, because our priority was the saints. But well, I'm totally against the saints. Because in 1852, in this library, my great-grandfather, also no Smith, was branded on the shoulder because he was a runaway slave. Come on, let's be real. Y'all taught me this now. Y'all got me to think like this. We were taught about it. I never call you the N-word. You're still dear brother, dear sister. If I anger you, we were taught to apologize. My whole life, from my family to the Black Panther Party, that's why I'm here today. And I mean, it was a wonderful organization still today. But one of the things we allowed to happen was we allowed the media to tell us, right? And I do an exercise. Let me see if I'm going to get somebody easy. Right here, brother, my class, we stand up again. See what the media does. Us. Watch this. What is your name? Jason. Jason. Spell it for me. That's beautiful. But guess what? It was wrong. I never said spell your name. I said spell it. That's what they've been doing us. That's what they do us. They put the messages out and we buy into them. And the first thing happened is, I found a report, and if you want, I'll give you my email, I'll share it with you. I've been doing some research, Russia and a whole bunch of folks, that was a plan in 14 and 15 and 16 for us not to turn out on internet, in our communities. It was almost trying to start a race ride. It's public information. My email is coleman 7 coleman at gmail. I'll send it to you. And I've been reading for the last couple of months and all the things are in place. The messages that you hear. Again, what is your name? Spell it. And that's what they do. And we allow that to happen in our community. We can disagree to disagree, but then we get so mad, I want to cut your head off. If I tell you some of the stories that I get, because I don't make a lot of protests with the NAACP, because I don't believe in running and saying anything, but I'll get you, because I got a good lawyer friend over there and a couple of them somewhere else. We'll get you, right? And one of the things they taught us to do, we were taught to read and to do research and learn your rights. Civil engagement is not a spectator sport. If you want to be a spectator, go sit in the arena. But in this life, you have to get involved, and we have to take it. We did this. Two weeks ago, we had to go to Houston. We had to go to Baton Rouge. We had to go to Graham, it's wherever. But then, let the numbers reflect. You still had eight days to vote, right? Still had eight days. Well, let's make it ten because you had early. You could have did an early voting ballot, but our priorities are where they are today, right? Now the other piece is, <clears throat> I've been working in the penal system for thirty years in different capacity. Uh, I went back uh, about seven months ago as the maintenance supervisor <coughs> over construction, and, and, and I'm and I'm just perplexed by we sitting on our hands for mental health in the city of New Orleans. We have allowed you to get treatment in the jail. Come on, man. How that really go? Really, how does that really go for us as a community? We have a mental health problem. That is real serious. But your treatment has to come from the jail. That's, that's, that's a hard pill to swallow for. And I think we need to look in the mirror. Because one of the things the lady said at the National Convention, say, you know, when you go back to New Orleans round, ask you folks, are you an asset or a liability? And I think all of us tomorrow morning, when you get home and say what? Are you an asset or a liability? Right? So I get back to where, I, where I'm up here. But in, when they came to shoot up the project that day, we locked arms around the building. They left. Right? All of them left. They came in the wee hours in the morning. 
But let me show you how life is. You can take my name and run it. I'm Ronald Coleman. You go to the Africa, show you how life is. 2014, I went to work back at the Sheriff's Department. The same commander that got the tank, Jerry Erson, went to shoot us up, right? Guess what? He called me an ungrateful effing N-word. And God knows I sued him like it was nothing else. Look it up. Look it up and he had to leave. And you know Tony was going to get me, but I'm still here. Right? This is so ironic. In 1968, you was going to blow us up. 2014, you called me ungrateful inward because I was in your parking spot to fix your air condition. It was 104 degrees in his office, right? And about an inch in the lot. It's in the paper. Look at that. Ronald Coleman, who was African. I don't bite my tongue. So at the end of the day, I said, maybe something bigger than this, right? So the spirit of these brothers right here is everlasting. And I'll probably go to my grave just like this. I promise you, I will go. And it's in me. Now this brother got my children, what, they 25, 26, right? He had it for a whole summer. You know what they came on doing? <laughs> I'm serious. Daddy, we got it. All right, all right. So we was dish, we got a, some sweet potatoes from the black farmers. Uh, we won some other uh, stuff. So we got six tons of sweet potatoes in 2004. We had sweet potatoes all around the city. So Malik jacked my children for about a week. And they thought it was their right to feed everybody that needed something. So, and I still have that problem. You say, well, you know, Miss Monique said, if you got dead, you got to help them. 26 and 20, if you know what else they say, right? <laughs> That's what it's at. And they vote, my three-year-old grandson, by the 27 year old he can tell you right now, he watched the news, right? He watched the news, and you know what else it does? People. Right, you got it. There you go. We have to start young. We have to start right now with our children. Thank you all so much again. Um, if it's all right with you all, we would like to offer the audience 20 minutes for short questions. Is that all right? Um, for those of you who would like to ask a question, if you could, could you come line up at the podium right here so we can get you on the mic? Um, would anybody like to come up and ask any questions of our Black Panther Party today? No. Anybody? We, hey, I think I think y'all have like answered all the questions. Oh wait, here we go. Yes. So in the 10 point program, all power to the people. Number eight says an end to war and aggression. Aggression, aggressive wars, right? And I personally am a believer that justice, is, justice and freedom is a one beautiful struggle for everywhere and everybody. And I think the Panthers always talked about being in solidarity with all the oppressed peoples of the world. So at this given moment, our nation in league with other nations is involved in supporting war and aggression in many places, but the one that we can see plainly on the screen right now is Palestine. I wanna hear what some of y'all think about that. War and aggression right now against oppressed people in their own homeland. I was hoping some I was hoping someone else would <laughs> take this question, but it doesn't look like anyone wanna take it, so I imagine how we I, I think first of all I would say I understand what the brother saying and what that's taking place, the war of aggression. Well, I, I think we have, or should have, or, or we should evolve to the point of realizing that instead of studying war, I think we should uh, point out and make it plain that there are no winners in war, only losers. It doesn't matter if one lose a thousand and another lose one hundred thousand. The suffering of the people who uh, who had, who one went to loss is just as great as 
the loss of those who have lost a thousand or ten thousand. So I, I think the emphasis, you know, of us today, and I think uh, I'm in teaching with the evolution of the Black Panther Party because I think the Black Panther Party what about democracy? And democracy means people power. It is not racist ideology, it is not uh, you know, politicians' power, but it's it's people power. Uh, I think it's so uh, the word is a Greek and you know, and it means people power. Uh, uh, and I think we have to understand that and we have to put in the context and we have to also understand that. Revolution, you know, of uh, democracy is not a conclusion. It's an evolution. And if we go about trying to achieve democracy, you know, as being a conclusion, as being a conclusion, we'll never make it. It is from one struggle, it's elevation from one struggle to the next. You know, when Harriet Tubman brought that point slave to freedom, she was saying, the Black Lives Matter, that was a struggle. And even before her, when Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, even during the Civil War, when the war was fought, you know, it was a war that was fought for democracy. When the so-called, and I say so-called, when the founding fathers, you know, decided to migrate or move away from, from England, they, they decided to, uh, to seek democracy. It was something that they were den denied. And I think they understood this, that this was a process and not a conclusion. And I think we have to look at it like that. We have to see that our democracy or whatever democracy that we are trying to achieve, people power, is a conclusion. It's not a conclusion, that is, it's a process. And each generation has their, their job before them to make sure that this evolution continues. I think this is our quest. The quest for democracy has to continue, and it goes across the board. It is not black, white, brown, nor yellow. It's people power. Uh, I also think that you have to understand the country in which you live. And a lot of people don't understand, or they refuse to understand, they refuse to recognize the country in which we live. And so the policies and the decision makings and all of the stuff that go on behind closed doors that we don't know about or we know about and we refuse to talk about or refuse to bring it to the table has a lot to do with it. I hear people talk a lot about education, right? And, and folks not getting out to vote and blah, 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 blah. It took civics out to school. Civics taught you how the system ran. The children, I don't know that. They took history out of the school. They took social studies out of the school. All of those vital subjects they took out of the school, that taught us how things ran. The teachers who taught them taught us how it was run. So they don't have that anymore. They don't have those subjects anymore. They don't have civics that you had to have in the ninth grade. It was a requirement as a ninth grader. They don't have that anymore. So therefore, they don't know about the system. They don't know how the system is run. They don't know the things and the ins and outs that the system has. So, but we allow it as people, and I am gonna say this, particularly as African-American people, we allow them to take that from our children. So therefore, you have generations of children who don't know. So you can't blame them because they don't know. They don't know. Again, going into the world history, understanding how this country is run and the things that this country do and have done is what it is all about. And until that day that we recognize and understand how this country is run, you're going to always have that problem. You're going to always have that war. You're going to always have that power because they're power hungry. Power hungry brings money hungry. So until you have, like, like my girl said, until the day comes, you're going to always have that problem.
at my white church, my wife is a minister, and I'm an imam, Islamic imam. I would come here and I'm an imam in Angola. Because it was next spiritual development to me. Because when I read in Quran, fight oppression and worse than slaughter, I that's what I've been doing. And I thank Almighty God for putting it in perspective for me. And I tell my wife at her church when the preacher said, pray for Israel, I had to speak. I had to speak like, hey, you can't get your old history class right now. But go back to 1949 on up. See, you have to see a bigger picture. You just see part of the picture. You see all both of them tear. Both of them, her don't represent the Palestinian people. His beloved don't represent Islamic people. That's right. Being in history, his beloved part of my life, not the part of my life, political. This thing is spiritual. And leaking it on the head. You know, it's spiritual. I mean, my wife would be three years married on the 22nd this month, next month. Three okay. years. And let me tell you what, what a concept would believe that. He's a Christian minister. I'm a man. Show me who's fighting. What a piece. No, I'm showing you, you have to know the history. Her mind is a bush. We didn't hear with, but look, you got to have what made him go to that, make that response. So if you've been in power where you got the weapon to it called restraint, it's on you to call restraint. It's on Israel to call restraint. So what Israel is really doing, it's just supposed to come to the surface, who are the peacemakers? Did it look that up? 21 years old, they painted as a villain, they ain't trying to try to marry security, didn't it? We the rumors of that. So what we're saying now, like the youngsters say, don't go for the hype. Don't go for the hype. I mean, after the sword all clear, you're going to see the peacemakers, who are the peacemakers? And y'all see that with us now? Nah, are we getting all this here? That don't move me all this here. You know what moved me? If that's a piece of paper in the community and trade just high, you gotta call the camera to clean up. Put on your man and go clean it up. And people saying that's the leader. You know, with the camera there, you know, the camera gone. 40 years, a two week journey? So that's what we're saying now. Nah, you know, fit in where you get in. That's what you're saying about now. You obligated now. Nah, you heard the truth, you see the truth. Now, how can you address the truth? And isolate the war mongers. All them war mongers. Then you see all them coming in cahoots. Rocket man, food. Look at them. Rocket man that big, fat, ain't he? Why eating all the food? The people ain't got no food. Look, get into your raw and how it go. All of you running over here. For what? For freedom. Running in front of all them dictators. Who finance them dictators? Get rid of the America. Not American people. A, a, a small group. So what we're saying now is that the light is on and shining bright, and you can't put it out. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lewis Butler. I'm a 2L uh, student at Southern University Law Center. My question for the panel today is, how do you feel the new Black Panther Party is aligning or disaligning with the goals and foundations that you have set in the work that you've done uh, with the history of the party? I'm a firm supporter of the new Black Panther Party. When I look at young brothers that stand up, that standing up for our community, I see it in those young brothers. Is they always right? No, but they definitely not always wrong. They're doing something. I support them, and I will always support them. Cause they have shown nothing but love and support toward us. Uh, but before I go on and say anything else, I got to uh, recognize Orissa, Orissa Aaron, and her husband Richard. Uh, during the dark years when nobody wanted to, to hear about the Black Panther Party, Arissa was there. She wrote about us, 
Some said it was wrong, some said it was right. But she did something. So again, that's what we have to do. We have to do something. And, uh, in 1971, right after our release from prison, from incarceration, when we was found not guilty, the first thing we did in the night ward, we worked on Johnny Jackson's campaign. We worked on it tirelessly with him and his wife. Johnny Jackson was a person that when, while we was going to trial was savagely beaten by New Orleans police, black New Orleans police, in, at Tulane and Broad. That's why I, I always go by all skin folks and kin folks. Yeah. So I watched that. And I watched Johnny Career from a, a state legislator to a, a, a city council. Always keeping this community at heart. I brought with me. I don't have enough copies for everyone. But this is what we did in 72 in Lowell. And uh, this was before, right before Chairman Bobby Seals announced his campaign and started running for office. But this is a picture of him and Erica Huggins. And if you notice, one of the things that's on the bottom was registered to vote. So as they talk about what the party was about, it was about that process, that democratic process, getting out, registering the vote. Out as a black man, I believe that's my obligation. Too many of our forefathers died for that right, was hung. And we owe it to their memory. But most of all, we owe it to those kids for their future. And we hate for you to have to tell your kids why you didn't vote for change. And the only thing you could say is because you, was, uh, you thought supporting the saints was a little bit more important than saving that their community. That you thought going to a concert was more important than saving our environment. Because that's what's at risk now. You young people are facing something that we never never even thought about how life going to continue on this planet. We just went through one of the hottest summers. The Mississippi River is drying up. The Gulf is polluted. And I'm going to tell you, I truly believe that so goes the Gulf, so goes America. So goes America, so goes life as we know it on this planet. We leaving you a legacy that you're going to have to clean up. What you going to do? with the weapons of mass destruction that's here in this country, 
that's going to be antiquated in the next 50 years. You can't put them all on a Navajo reservation. What you going to do with the toxins? And we steady poison our lakes and streams. After Hurricane Ida, for almost 10 days, we pumped raw sewage in the Gulf of Mexico. Nobody's saying anything. We have over a thousand abandoned oil rigs right off the coast of Louisiana. And we are not saying anything. Hundreds of thousands of miles of pipeline abandoned. Nobody's monitoring. You're going to be our future. It's going to be students like yourself that's going to make a difference whether life continue as we know it. We not, maybe we have gone too far with climate change, that we can't stop it. But we sure could slow it down by working together. We got too many, because as an African-American man that have been through just about all that uh, a poor black man can go through, it don't mean nothing if we can't breathe this air and drink this water. We stand in a position that we got to show the world what we are about. We just elected this man as our governor. Is we going to do the same thing next year for president? I mean, give it some thought. The Saints going to the Super Bowl? Is that more important than getting out here and not only registering, but voting? We have to get out there. We have to join and work with others. I believe in when somebody said earlier about Chairman Fred Hampton, who was the deputy chairman of the Illinois chapter, who was the original founder, him and Bob Lee, of the Rainbow Coalition. We have to get out there and, and understand the work that they did. Dr. King said that <clears throat> he never faced it the type of racism that he faced it in Chicago. And this is a statement from Dr. King. With Chairman Fred, at 20 years old, had those young preachers with their Confederate flags in a meeting with us, with our, Af with our Black Panther flag. Because one thing he said, you don't fight racism with racism. That's like fighting fire with fire. You fight racism with solidarity. And that's what we got to develop, the type of solidarity that we could leave a future. I'm one of the oldest on the stage. My life is coming to an end. I don't want to leave for my children and my grandchildren and for these kids up in here. A life of torment. Because that's what's at stake. My brother King hit it right on the, in war there's no one. All the policies or safeguards for our environment go out the window. Can we afford this? 
If there's a World War III, will we survive? What type of environment are we going to live for our legacy to these kids? Oh, yes, the, the work continues. We will continue, because right now, uh, we just finished the 57th anniversary of the Black Panther Party, and we're already organizing for the 58th. So again, as long as, I can say as long as I have breath, I know what it is important. And I know there's nothing no more important than to get involved in a struggle for environmental peace and justice. Yeah. Okay, how many questions do I have? Two? Um, if it's if it's relatively short, yeah, I think we can do y'all or y'all both have questions. Okay, we'll do your two questions last and, and then and then we will give everybody a break. <laughs> how you doing? My name is Eliezer Craig. Um, I'm a student at Southern University Law Center and I'm a retired veteran from the Army. I just wanted to, as you spoke so eloquently about the legacy, I wanted to ask if one or two of you could just say if if you could speak to a generation far removed, you know, 2070, 2090, about the legacy in one short sentence, what would you say to them? The legacy you want them to take away and know about the party? Well, I can't do it in one second, one second. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at four o'clock, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook to let people know that whatever happened that, that has caused destruction, it wasn't done in my name. That I stood up and I've stated, I've stated about the struggle for environmental peace and justice. Everybody got to do their part. You got to think about whether your children or grandchildren, can you look them in the eye and tell them why you left them a dying planet? Or are you going to look them in the eye and tell them how we, when we was on the, bank, on the blank of destruction that we rose up and showed the greatness that exists not just in, in, in our legacy, but in our American legacy. We got to do this. We have been blessed that we are in the, the richest, the most powerful nation on this planet. I don't know of no other place have as many schools of higher learning than here. There's over a hundred historically black colleges and universities with over 200,000 students. And I'm not talking about no other colleges but those. I think Southern and also Jackson, because Jackson is in the most blackest city in America. And we have a responsibility. Next month, y'all will be playing the Bayou Classic. Come down and not only play football, but come down to some of our communities and show some of these youngsters a positive example of a black man or a black woman. Let them truly see what your university is about. I think that we can change this. I don't think we have to just go down the path of destruction. I believe that, that you, especially you young attorneys, 
going to be the one that wake us up from the drunken state of prosperity so that we can understand what we are at risk of losing. So no, I don't think it's going to be done in two minutes. And if you want to listen to me again, I'm on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 4 o'clock. So come on and listen. Thinking if I, anything that I can do, I don't accept messages. Because I don't want to hear what you got to say. I want to tell you what I have to say. Okay. Right, so I stop being uh, effective, don't listen. But if you want to, listen. And let's start working toward how can we save this planet? Because that's what's at risk. How can we save life as we know it? Short and sweet, as the party always said, dare to struggle, dare to win. There's always going to be a sacrifice that's called upon somebody to make. Are you willing to make that sacrifice? Dare to struggle, dare to win. Another question? Okay. I want to thank y'all brothers. Right? I was born in, it's ironic though, uh, my name is Kendrick Smith Sr. Um, I'm online, y'all can Google OG King, letter OG King zone um, with ASCAP. I'm an artist, I'm a social entrepreneur, pretty much I, you know, I kind of take the game. So it was about war and terrorism, right? It's about money. You know, and I'm going to share something right now. Y'all already know this. I'm going to be sure with this. You know, the Iraq war, the, the war in Iraq that began in 2003 has drawn billions of dollars from the American economy. Some companies, including those that make bullets and tanks and uniforms, have benefited greatly. We understand that? So we're talking about stakeholders that benefit off of these wars. But yet the people who are out there, they, they dying and suffering, you know. It's the same thing just what happened with colonialism. My grandmother, we Cherokee Indian and black, right? They came down with the rebel flag and all of that. I shot all that down when Luke, when Luke, uh, Mr. Landry was in office because of what I learned in college. I had to come down there and shoot all that down and take films and put the word out, put the spirit, put the, put the, put the truth out. Uh, but there was something else. I'm going to be gone. I'm going to go with this one here. This is this, this the last one right here. People didn't know about the education that we missed in the school. There's a book that Tom Joyner Back in the 90s, he had, I heard, heard him on the radio, Ice Cube the Rapper, about the black, the, the best of the little black history facts, all right? I had to get that tatted on my own, all right? Now, the first African leader in the West, Tucson L. Overture, under the, after this I'm done, under the guidance of his mother golf, and Godfather, who taught him French, Latin, geometry, and instilled in him a deep faith in God, were responsible for Haiti becoming an independent nation in America in 1804 second to the United States. In 1791, after the Haitian Revolution began with a courageous slave named Balkan Toussaint, used his skills to conquer the former French and Spanish slave owners, defeated the British army, and conquered Napoleon in Haiti, and caused the defeat in Europe as well. See, that's the stuff they kept from us. But what I do online, every vibe move on daily, OG kids on, y'all see? I've been doing it, I didn't just stop. You know, on the streets and everything. All right, in 1802, when Napoleon tried to re-enslave black people and enlisted uh, in, on an island in, of Haiti, it was two sons genes, genes that destroyed army after army and weakened Napoleon's position in France. Deceived by diplomats, which we know as politicians, right, in an effort to make peace, he was kidnapped and taken to France and imprisoned by Napoleon until his death on April 7, 1803. According to the research of J.A. Rogers, Tucson had planned after Haiti was free to go to Dahomey, West Africa, and use it as a base to fight the slave trade. He saved six million dollars, which he entrusted in Stephen Gerard, a white American ship captain. At the Tucson's cap, Gerard refused to deliver the money to Tucson's family. Gerard became the richest American of his day. He left millions on his debt in his debt in 1803 for the founding of Gerard College, College in Philadelphia, stipulated that it should be for whites only. He also gave money to buy coal for the poor whites of Philadelphia. See, that's what I do. But I want to get in contact with y'all, with you guys, all right? Because I'm honored to even be here. I just put on that website some months ago a picture with Huey P. Newton. I got a picture with him with an afro, right? 
See, people didn't know, <clears throat> people didn't understand, it's like what y'all was talking about, I'm glad y'all did that. P.O.P. knew was sitting on the with an afro, and he got black kids behind him, he showed the story how the Black Panther started, right? And everything when he went to college and how he had got into it was fighting, wound up going to prison and, and, and everything else. But I had to do that to let people understand. And I'm also against the media. I'm the, I'm the one that's fighting against them because I, I, I did all the research on that and who started and everything else. But I want to get y'all number and, and, you know, network with y'all on that online. You say you're on Facebook, sir? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's what I want y'all to understand that we still got fighters. We got soldiers out here. You know, we out here. I know I'm out. I've been out. Here, you know, I got black balls being out here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. White balls. Well, well, white, white ball. Yeah, I, yeah. I used, to, I used to keep that hospital up right there. Is it right? Yeah. Okay, we got uh, two more short questions for you all, and then we'll give you some rest. Okay. Hello everyone, good evening. Okay, my question is, well, I first want to make a statement. I feel like as a community, we focus too much on the past instead of the future. And I feel like our community, our state, our government, it runs off of money, currency. So with that, it's like us as a community, us as people, us as humans, we are relying on the government when it comes to our resources, whether it's food, whether it's money, whether it's, come here baby, whether it's, it's just we depend on, on for the government for everything. So it's like my question is, as a community, what do you guys, like what plans, or what plans do you think that we can make to meet the community to what we depend on ourselves as the community to make sure that everything around us, whether that's nature, our food process, like to make that better to where we don't have to depend on everything that's around us and we depend on ourselves as a community, we come together as a community. That's my question. Like, what, what, what do we do as a community to make sure when everything is corrupt, for example, we use COVID as the COVID quarantine. If we go back into that state and we're not able to provide for our community and we're stuck, we don't have the food or the water, the resources that we need, what can we do as a community to fix that? First question, we start with ourselves. First question is, what are you, or we, or any of us prepared to do? We need to educate ourselves, yes. and then we need to start doing stuff, opposed to, you say history, you can't get to the future unless you come from the history, so you, you have to start somewhere. Start with you, start with me. Each one of us, start with ourselves. What can I do? We ask that question, what can I do? And we educate ourselves as to what we can do. I mean, a lot of people are dependent on the government, right. but you can't do no better until you get some education. Study. What are you interested in? I'm not just talking to you, but as an individual, what can I do? What can, what what interests me? See, I can't do what she do. She likes to teach school. Right. That's her thing. That's what she do. I can't do that. I like to preach. So that's what I do. I preach. What can you do to bring about a change? Each one of us as an individual have to face that question for ourselves and then collectively right. find people with the same interests right. and move that way. Thank right. You. So going back to the statement about the younger generation and living in the past, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. As we said earlier, we, we even us, we stand on the shoulders of our elders who right. taught us. So you cannot, in my opinion, you cannot wipe out the elders. You cannot wipe out. This brother just ran down some history. How many people sitting here knew that history? I said earlier, they're taking history out of the schools. 
If you don't know from once you came, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. So you cannot negate the elders. You cannot negate the history. You cannot negate where we came from. You cannot negate how we got to where we are today. Right. Was it always right? No, it wasn't. But the sacrifices that were made, we talked about registering to vote. If it wasn't for the ancestors, the ones whose shoulders we stood on, we wouldn't be able to vote. And that piece, a lot of times in terms of the younger generation, is missed. If it wasn't for the elders, if it wasn't for the ones that came before us, a lot of things we would not have. They got beat down, they got ran over, they had dogs turned on them, they had hose pipes turned on them, just to fight, to be treated as a human being in this country. So then you have to make a decision. Like my comrade Betty said, you have to make a decision in which direction you want to go. Right. You, you can't forget the past. You cannot. Because the past dictates what's going to go on. Right. Again, to address that question, all you have to do is just look around at these two kids right there, your kids, and understand that we, our responsibility is to educate them. Right. And through education brings about, as, as we always say, that knowledge is power. And we have to empower our community and the task that lays upon our shoulder. Uh, again, as Betty said, Mariam said, you know, educate. That's that's the foundation of our mission. To right. educate our people on what has to be done. So that's what I, I can right. give you about the education. That's the key. And, a, and, and, key. and it's something else I wanted to put out there. Because uh, we we, we're constantly talking about the generations, right? Yeah. And the problem that we're having right now with the generation. Uh, but if we don't do anything to educate the generation, if you think you're having problems now, wait until that generation start producing. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. going to get worse if it's not, yeah. you know, educating the kids and stuff like that. That's why I was concerned. I'm like, because us as a black community, well, not even just the black community, like us as humans, we don't have the education that we need when it comes to surviving, like, when it comes to living in nature and surviving without this stuff. That's my point. My point is, what are, what are we gonna do when this is not here? When all of this is not here? The move that we need to do, make us, we can do things by ourselves and take action by ourselves, but it do start with itself, but we also need each other too, in order for us to have a firm foundation to where we don't have to rely on this. That's what I'm saying. Whether it's the currency, whether it's the shelter, the corporations, I'm saying that we, us as a whole, as a people, we need to figure out what are we going to do when this is not here anymore? What are we going to do when we need to learn how to make medicines and stuff like that and not depend on this, not depend on the doctors and stuff like that? We need to educate. Yeah, so I'm asking my another question. What do you think we can do as a community to do that? As all of you sitting up here, what can we do? What can you guys do? What can we do as a community to come together to fix this? Yeah, I, I, I want to say, like, I think a lot of you have answered the question, but I know y'all are talking, and I want to get some okay. applause for everybody. Like, since <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank everybody who is here. I know Angela and Suno had to go on a tour, so I apologize. But I want to thank 
every member of the Louisiana Black Panther Party who has been here today. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for like putting forward the path for the next generation. I think this is incredible and thank you for being here. Thank you. Oh yeah, did you wanna, yeah, please ask him, please, please. I just have a quick question. Don't beat me up. I'm sorry. Um, so, talking about the Black Panthers' ideology, when y'all first started out, how did the mindset or the ideology change over time? Like, how did it, you know, the Black Panther Party develop relationship internationally? Um, there was a, a difference in leadership. There were a lot of women stepping up. Like, how did y'all ideology change over time? Is that a Oh, I doubt, bro. I think I'm never going to stop. Well, I'm going to tell you. We're still determined to serve the people. They come to the community any way that we can. We're still available. There's not a black country party in New Orleans, but there we are alumni. And we are here. And we're going to be here. And we're going to ask the questions. We'll help in any way we can. Because the people who are here are not going to be what you mean? I, I don't understand the question. So, how did the ideology change? So, like Huey Newton talks about intercommunalism, how, like, at, in the beginning it was about helping people in the community, but then they realized that the struggle was more than just what was happening nationally, but internationally. So, like, how did the. I, 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 I don't think it ever changed. We said we want freedom to our power to become our destiny. I think that was one of the first 10 point programs. Uh, part of the program. We want freedom power to determine our destiny. And on through, we want land, grade, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. as a major political objective, but the United Nations supervised public site to be held. And I think all of this was put in place. I think even before the Black Panther Party, there were, you know, Malcolm, of course, he went to Mecca and he found his life in Mecca. Mal Malcolm understood that at first, besides, before it was Malcolm saying, you know, some other thing that, uh, with, in regard to democracy, when he saw people living of all colors, all walks of life, living in harmony, he could not understand what was happening here in the United States. He went back with a whole different concept in, in ideology, and he embraced democracy. And so I think the thing is this, that the Black Panther Party grew in, up, in, and Huey Newton was a small man, and Bobby Sears and all the rest of the people who were there, David and all of them. But the idea is this, that we wanted to embrace concept of democracy, which would say that, in other words, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and it was saved by the founding fathers. So they, uh, the idea is to continue to hold America responsible for this, because again, uh, democracy is not a conclusion, it's a process. I think every generation have to uh, operate, they have to work, they have to, in other words, they have to make sure that this process is rich. And I, I don't think it can be done in one, two, three, four generations. It took years and years and years to get here. Um, anything that, is, look, racism is, is, is a, a learned reflex, and it's not, it cut across the masses. It's black, white, yellow, or whatever you want to. But it is, racism is, is a, is a process, it is, is, is not democracy. You know, democracy is a, is, is a process and not a conclusion. Racism has no place in a democracy because race, a democracy is colorblind. It's simple as that. And I think we have to continue to pursue down that path that democracy itself is colorblind. It don't, it don't, in other words, and if you live in a society that, that does not give you democracy, that do not have a colorblind society, it is not a democracy, it's a hypocrisy. And that's what the Black Panther Party was saying then, and that's what the Black Party is saying now. When you and Newton and the Black Panther Party embraced the concept of democracy, they were embracing something that was concrete, something that was legitimate, and something that was pure. And if it was practice, all people were prosper. What did you say about the evolution of Black Panther Party? Yes. Good testimony of that. We we never the natural We always put press. So you, you see right now, like I see, I didn't go there and go raise up my fist, say power to people that the pain. The first time I was there, I was there a short time, six months. <laughs> it went to the fair, but that time I had four years of life. So I ain't gonna get power to the pain. I evolved. And no one thing was education. That's the key. That we're saying that now. So we can't get the solution and just get me. No one wanted. I eat elephant. Live it out of town. <laughs>
Let's have one final round of applause for everybody. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for answering questions. And please, um, please go ahead and we can take pictures. I want to thank you all for being here and have a good afternoon.